This week has seen Zimbabwe's president, Emerson Mnangagwa, plead for patience as his government struggles to revive the ailing economy. And Nigeria's president, Muhammadu Buhari, confirms that he will not seek a third term in office at the end of his presidency. This is Africa Focus. The cruel choice in jihad hit Burkina Faso. Mozambicans defy odds to play roller hockey. Cameroon's Silicon Mountains lows down amid separatist conflict. I'm Lenny Rashid, and our sign language interpreter today is Tracy Dorcas. Before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent this week. African migrants are in limbo near Mexico's southern border protesting during a visit from the UN's refugee chief on Saturday, speaking out against their living condition in migrant camps and the border city of Tepechula. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, was visiting Tepechula on Saturday to inaugurate a new United Nations center to help register and look after migrants in Mexico's south border area. Every year, thousands of people from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras and some of the world's most impoverished and violent nations head north in search of a better life. Now, an increasing number of Africans are joining them with the aim of reaching the United States. The number of Africans registered by Mexican authorities tripled in the first four months of 2019 compared with the same period years ago, reaching about 1,900 people, mostly from Cameroon and the Democratic Republic of Congo, which remains deeply unstable years after the end of a bloody regional conflict with its neighbors that led to the death of millions of people. Tougher measures from Mexico under pressure from the United States has seen many migrants stuck at the border, refused passage northway through Mexico. As Gambia's tourist season begins, hotel owners are still trying to cut down on losses after the bankruptcy of British tour operator Thomas Cook on 23rd September 2019. The British holiday maker was one of the largest tourist outfitters in the small western African country with 45% of tourists entering the Gambia through Thomas Cook according to Gambia's government. Two emergency meetings have been organized by the government to find an emergency solution before the country's touristic season begins in November. The force commander of the African Union mission in Somalia, Amisom, awarded medals and certificates to 34 staff officers serving at the forces headquarters in Mogadishu for the contribution in helping the mission achieve its mandate of restoring peace and stability in Somali. The officers were decorated at a function presided over by Force Commander Lieutenant General Tigabu Yilma, who commended them for their dedication and selfless service towards the restoration of peace, security and stability in the country. Among those honored at a colorful function held in Mogadishu were officers from from the United Kingdom mission support team Benin, Burundi, Djibouti, Egypt, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Britain's Prince Harry met with landmine victim Sandro Tigika during his tour of Angola 22 years after Tigika was held by his late mother, Princess Diana. Princess Diana's visit in 1997 highlighted the plight of the country which remains plagued by landmines 17 years after the end of its civil war. Sandra Tigika was 13 years old when she met Diana in Neves Bindiha in 1997, a few months before Diana's fatal car crash in Paris. The encounter which took place in the British ambassador residence in Luanda came during a trip that had Harry follow in Diana's footsteps. You, you still look as young as you did in those pictures all those years ago. Early in the day, Harry walked down Princess Diana Street and sat beneath the Diana tree, the spot where his mother, who campaigned for a global ban on mines, was photographed. The landmines were planted during Angola's 27-year civil war, which ended in 2002. Many people remained displaced and thousands have been left with disabilities from landmines, which continue to kill and maim. Thank you very much for showing incredibly warm hospitality uh, to me and my whole team. This trip to Angola was always going to be very special and very uh, emotional for me to be able to follow my, in my mother's footsteps. Uh, 
um, but we've had an incredibly productive last two days. Harry's visit to Angola is part of a South African trip by him, Megan and their four-year-old son, Archie. The first overseas tour as a family began in South Africa on Monday on September 23rd. <laughs> Jibo, a dusty town in northern Burkina Faso, has become a byword for suffering in this impoverished country's seven-year-old struggle with jihadism, which has forced an estimated 300,000 people to flee their homes. Among them is Buermo, head of a family of 43 people who abandoned his village of Gasapalok, 70 kilometers from Jibo, and migrated to Yagma. Jibo, a dusty town in northern Burkina Faso, has become a bayword for suffering in this impoverished country's seven-year-old struggle with jihadism. More than 580 people have been killed since the insurgency spilled over the neighboring Mali. Attacks on emblems of the states, hit and runs raids on remote villages, and brutal interpretation of Islamic laws have forced an estimated 300,000 people to flee their homes. Among them is Buerima, head of a family of 43 people. Seven men, 13 women and 23 children. They were attacking everyone, those they called unbelievers. Among the victims were Muslims, Protestants, Catholics. In short, no one was spared. We had to run for our lives. They abandoned the village of Gasalpalik, 70 kilometers from Jibu, eventually washing up to Yagma, a village about 30 kilometers from the capital, Laogadugu. Belen said he had spent his entire life in Jibu and had never even left the area until now. In this alien landscape, the family has no friend or contacts. The head of the village has appointed a tutor to help the family, who are members of the Mosi ethnic group, get their bearings. <laughs> The attackers were targeting everyone. They were looting our livestock and property, so we were forced to leave. The family hurriedly bundled up its major possessions and the little money it had. Binto, an older woman member of the group, said the family was at least able to sleep peacefully in their beds, but that was little consolation to what they had lost. Life is much better here. It's peaceful. Where we were, we couldn't sleep at night because they could arrive at any time. We had to keep an eye on things, even the children. The families are living in homes which have been made available for free by the villagers, but it has no land, a crucial source of nutrition, and income in a place where there is no work. High-tech promoters had big dreams for Silicon Mountain in Cameroon, where a broad plateau was seen as a perfect for startup ventures. But their hopes have been shattered by a separatist struggle. Entrepreneurs in the tech village wanted to launch new technologies and make Cameroon a market player on the model of California. But the bloody insurgency in the country's English-speaking West has driven many to leave. High-tech promoters had big dreams for Silicon Mountain in Cameroon, where a broad plateau was seen as a perfect for startup ventures, but their hopes have been shattered by a separatist struggle. The ambitious Silicon Mountain project bears the economic and social scars of a conflict that has claimed more than 2,500 lives since 2017. According to international NGOs, many of the dead and wounded are civilians. Working from home, normally in this space, they usually used to be about 15, 25 persons, sometimes even 50 used to be very active sites because this is where our startups usually work. Uh, but these days you have just one person, as you can see, just a few of them who come here to work. Um, because first of all, it's not safe to get out of the building to actually go and do customer development. It's not safe. Active spaces is a key link for business at Silicon Mountain. The walls at its headquarters are decorated in the colors of global internet giants. The high-tech incubator site is meant to extend from Bue, the capital of the southwest region on the slopes of the mountain, to the Chick Seaside resort of Limbe on the Gulf of Guinea, about 30 kilometers distant by road. Residents of Bue hope for peace to return, but few express any faith in a great national dialogue convened by President Paul Beer. Bia, ruler of the Central African nation for the seven years, has invited representatives of the Anglophone Southwest and Northwest, the capital Yaoundé, to settle the crisis. 
je crois que ça a des chances de succès si tout le mécanisme est mis en place. Déjà, I think it has a chance of success if the whole mechanism is put in place. I think we need to identify the different stakeholders, involve everyone. That means all Cameroonians, whether they're from the diaspora or those who are in the country in various lines of work. Que ce soit ceux qui sont dans les pays, dans les dans les divers secteurs d'activité. But most of the separatists, along with a major part of the political opposition, have decided to boycott the national dialogue for lack of ceasefire and until their jail leaders are released. Honestly, we are not, we are not hoping that much will come out from the dialogue process, partly because the premise is wrongly set. Personally, that's my personal opinion, and I think it's the view of most of us around here. We're not super excited that something good will come out of it. La première chose, c'est que le dialogue n'est pas... This dialogue is not organized in a normal context of dialogue. We should have liked this dialogue to have taken place on a neutral ground. It is as if the head of state and his government had organized a football match in which they are the match steward, line referee and main referee. Radical separatist groups have waged an armed struggle with the security forces sent by Yaoundé, where authorities have remained largely deaf to the issues raised by the Anglophone minority, who make up 16% of the population. Troops are deployed almost daily to fight scattered radicals fighting for the self-proclaimed independent state of Ambazonia. Both sides have carried out atrocities against civilians, and more than 530,000 people have fled their homes. In 2017, the authorities cut internet services in the two regions for three months, a measure that drove farms from Silicon Mountain to move closer to Dola. Coming up after the break. Kenya focuses on clean energy. We'll be right back. Don't touch that dial. Keep it switch. Welcome back to Africa Focus. As nations around the world gather in New York in the United States to discuss and fasten the achievement of Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, Kenya is not left behind. Some Kenyan farmers like Albert Kamatu have already started implementing the much-needed sources of clean energy from biogas production. Albert Kamatu, an expert in vertical and vermiculture farming, is a techno-savvy farmer whose passion and dedication has seen him venture into green energy as well. Behind this greenhouse is a special structure designed for his biogas production. This is a home bio 2.0. It's a flexi-tube uh, biogas unit uh, from Israel. Uh, the cow, cow effluent or the pig effluent, eh? you need to have two drums. So to, to have this uh, whole, whole uh, whatever um, structure done, it will take you 1.2, that is uh, 1,200 liters of effluent. Eh? So you give it uh, 10 days, then it will have uh, constructed enough methane for you to use in your kitchen to boil. To cook. Biogas is a mixture of gases produced by the breakdown of organic matter without oxygen. Biogas can be produced from raw materials such as agricultural waste, manure, kitchen waste, plant material, or even sewage. It is a renewable source of energy. When you do one bucket of waste, you do, you do add the equivalent of water into the ratio of one bucket. So once you do it, you do the whatever you do the application of uh, uh, the waste and the water, uh, the decomposition starts already, because uh, of the way the unit is being designed from the uh, the receiving end. So with this, you find um, you do not necessarily need to be having so many farm animals for you to have this as a unit for uh, biogas production. The need for environmental conservation and the pressure to realize the Global Goals on Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, has led to widespread research on the accessibility of new and renewable energy sources like green energy. 
According to the World Economic Forum, Kenya's aim is to be powered entirely by green energy by the year 2020. It creates the gas and it has an effluent that comes from the end part of it that is liquid fertilizer. So with the liquid fertilizer, you can have it uh, applied in the farm, but you have to dilute it to the ratio of uh, one liter is to uh, five liters of water. We are focused on development of clean energy. Today, Kenya is among the top 10 global producers of geothermal electricity that give meaning to the theme of the General Assembly. Biogas is distinct from other renewable energies. The uniqueness comes in controlling and collecting organic waste material and at the same time producing fertilizer and water for agricultural use. With this, you save much in terms of energy. And uh, when you translate how you use your LPG, LPG gas, uh, you find uh, in two years, having invested in this, you are able to recover that money and now start enjoying the benefits of biogas. Albert then took us to his kitchen to prepare herbal uh, tea using his biogas. Considering the ever-swelling amount of diverse types of organic waste materials in Kenya, working on the control of waste material and biogas production becomes inevitable, even as the country strives to attain the 17 Sustainable Development Goals for Vision 2030, including affordable and clean energy to make the globe a better place. Safi Godana Mamo, Switch TV, Ruiru, Kiambu County. The first Biennale of Contemporary Art in Rabat proposes an archipelago of feminine artists showcasing works of 63 painters, filmmakers, videographers, choreographers, performers and architects as the first of its kind in Morocco. It's creating new narratives in the field of art. As museums and galleries recognize that there is a lot more work to be done to address the historic bias against female artists, the gender equality of biennials and other big group shows has also come under increasing scrutiny. But one exhibition, Robert Biennial, has opted to take a more dramatic tack, featuring 63 artists and collective, all of whom are female. I think that this is extremely important. So there are only women exhibiting at the international exhibition for a very simple reason, is that we need to revisit our relationship to create balance and equality in the history of art. The Bernal's curator, the French Algerian philosopher, art historian and museum director Abdel Kader Damani says that he decided to include only female artists in the central exhibition, which he has titled An Instant Before the World, in order to elevate voices that have been silenced in the conventional narrative of art history. So only women are exhibiting at the international exhibition for a very simple reason. We need to revisit our relationship to create a balance and equality in the history of art, simply because the history of art is essentially masculine. That is what we read in books, that is what we are looking at. And so there is an attempt by the Rabat Biennale to fix that element in history. In his attempt to forge a new history of art, Damani wanted to make space for work as well as to give Arabic-speaking artists the international exposure they have long been denied. Some 30% of the work included will be newly commissioned, and some 50 women writers, novelists and poets will also participate in a conference tied to the Biennale. They have been invited to write a new history of art from a female perspective. For me, it is important. There's also performance, dance and cinema, which are important in a biennial, as you can imagine. A lot of things are art, and that's a little bit the question. What is art and what is not art? Many forms are art, and what is interesting is the weaving and miscegenation that we will find in the biennial through all these artistic forms. The event also promises to engage locals, offering free entry and presenting work in a variety of disciplines, from visual art to music to film to performance as well as art street. 
Outside the main exhibition, the Biano will also offer a platform to a few careful selected male artists, including Mohammed El Baz. Floating sturgeon laboratories are common in Russia or Iran, but at Lake Mantasoa, a hydropower reservoir in the highlands of Madagascar at an altitude of 1,400 meters boasts Africa's first and only caviar farm. Jerome Bastide slides an ultrasound wand over the sturgeon's underbelly before a swift biopsy extracts a dozen <laughs> eggs and he returns the fish to the lake. So here we have a slightly larger egg size. So we are maybe on a 2.4 to 2.5. We are going to check. We need to do a biopsy to check the egg size. Donc là on est sur du 2, 6, 2, so here we have 2.6 to 2.7. So it's perfect for caviar. Certaine résistance, donc du coup on peut le, on peut transformer donc ça ça part en caviar. With the world's fourth highest rate of chronic malnutrition, Madagascar is an unlikely source for a luxury food that fetches upwards of 700 euros per kilogram in plush French restaurants. But Mantasoa's cool fresh water and inexpensive labor inspired three French entrepreneurs to set up a sipensa in 2009, importing their first batch of fertilized sturgeon eggs from France four years later. They all thought we were crazy. Even our closest friends said, ridiculous career in Madagascar. What's next? Someone in the desert. A lot of them laughed, but you've proved that it works very well. Now they produce rover caviar with 300 tons of fish from six different sturgeon species, 250 tons in their lake cages and 50 tons in their basins on land. They even produce their own fish food. A short drive from the lake lies the hatching ponds and processing factory, a featureless building where employees in head-to-toe sterile white protective clothing work in a chilled, spotless interior. Inside, a four-foot sturgeon is heaved onto a stainless steel gunny. One worker slices it up, while another carefully removes caviar for cleaning, sifting and salting. Each fish produces a pile of dark grey, brown or black eggs. Discolored eggs are removed with tweezers, salt is added and the final product decanted into cans to ripen. Around six months later, the precious granules are repackaged for export. What's particular with this caviar, it's very subtle in the mouth, buttery, and it will combine well with products from Madagascar like seafood. Outside the factory, a row of 19 rectangular hatching ponds lie side by side like a backward. Beneath the grey-green waters in two of the ponds are dozens of highly prized beluga sturgeon, which will start to mature in 2026. This year, the company will produce almost five metric tons for export, mostly to France, but also the United States and Reunion Island. In Mozambique, roller hockey or rink hockey is as popular as basketball and soccer. Roller hockey players are defying the odds and taking up the sport despite the heat and seemingly run-down surroundings. In aid dependent Mozambique, roller hockey, also known as rink hockey, is as popular as soccer and basketball. Introduced by both Portuguese during the colonial era, enthusiasm for the sport survived the fight for independence and 17 year civil war and countless natural disasters. Now, Mozambique has defied odds to play roller hockey. The country took part in its first international competition in 1978, three years after independence. Teenagers in worn down skates huddled in a circle at an old indoor gym in Mozambique's capital Maputo, faces drenched in sweat as their coach talks through the next drill. The Red Star Roller hockey team was training hard and deterred by the heat and their rundown surroundings as they listened intently before fanning out across the flaky wooden floor, whizzing seamlessly on their busted skates to take up positions for a five a side game. I feel very happy when I play hockey. I feel at ease. I feel comfortable. Around the hockey player paint peeled off the walls, the ceiling was ridden with holes, and shabby nets barely clung to their posts. Funding is often a struggle, explains coach Zefania Staimo, but the team's motivation keeps him going. 
It is complicated because, of course, you are all aware that our country has serious difficulties. But despite that, we are doing our best to keep all sports in general running, but especially rink hockey. 13-year-old Romeo Nkahada demanded who put on his first pair of skates at age five, along with teammates, show up twice a week for practice. I love skating. I've been skating since I was just a little child. That's why I like to play roller hockey. First we practice to be able to skate, then we learn how to hold the stick. If you're a player whose position is in goal, you learn how to stand in goal and follow the ball. Mozambique's national under-19 team came third at a major international tournament in Barcelona this year. On Africa Focus, we love hearing from you. So make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Remember, you can view this program along with our wide array of other programs on DSTV channel 268, on Azam TV channel 138, and on Zuku channel 53. On behalf of the entire team here on Africa Focus, thank you for keeping us company on this exciting journey. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing. Keep it switched.